All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is uh, Lee Woodmancy, uh, Pastor Lee Wood. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Emmanuel, and uh, I just want to say that I'm glad that you were here as all the kiddos are working their way out. How about y'all go ahead and turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be picking it up in verse 14 and 15, and then we're going to read on just a little bit further uh, from where we were last week. But what I want to do is I want to take a little bit of time just to recap what we're doing where we were last week, and work through that stuff real quickly. All right, so last week we began a series called God's Word, and we were kind of starting off in First and Second Timothy, but we're going to be moving around in a couple different places. And Pastor Anthony picked up uh, the idea of revelation. And we talked about the revelation of the Word of God and how this is how God is revealing something that was previously unknown and is now known, and he truly shows that to us. And where that's really important for us and how it applies to God's word is that that revelation of God that came through various ways is then inscripturated. It's put into a book, right? And so that revelation is, is a big deal for us because we now have a written record of that revelation, right? And most of you have a physical copy sitting in your lap of that revelation of God. And one of the big things that Anthony hit on was that Paul, in writing this letter to Timothy, is assuming, A, that Timothy knows God already, and B, that he can actually know God better moving forward, right? That he can grow in that relationship, yeah? And so we're going to pick up on that idea right out the gate. And I'm actually going to use the exact same illustration that Anthony did with his Bible from last week. If you remember how, how awesome his Bible was, it was like double gilded, it's got three ribbons, it's goat skin. Um, I want to tell you about my Bible because my Bible is none of those things. Uh, Anthony has uh, three ribbons. I've got one, and there's electrical tape on it holding it together. Uh, Anthony's Bible is goatskin cover. Mine is in two pieces, and this one actually has the duct tape holding it on. Uh, Anthony's paper is this super premium stuff that's double gilded. Uh, mine is actually brown on the edge from where it's been handled as much as it has. And here's why I think this is important for us, that as much as your Bible may look more like mine than it does Anthony's, um, you need to understand that it's no less powerful, that it's no less important, that it's no less anything. And that's due in part to God revealing himself to us and it being inscripturated and it's being recorded for us. But also what we're going to talk about today is about inspiration. We're going to talk about how the Bible is also inspired. So if you're thinking through all this, we're going to actually pick it up there in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. But I just want to say that we're going to talk about a question that is immediately connected to the nature of the Word of God. We're not necessarily talking about uh, all the mechanics that you may want to have answered in this sermon, but we're going to address one specifically. It leads us to a natural question when we think about the revelation of God. And here's where I want to start off. It's not by reading the scripture, but by talking about this question. If God has, in fact, revealed himself to somebody, okay, great. But here's a natural question. How do we know that what has been handed down to us, how do we know that we can trust that God's word has been reliably handed down to us beyond the immediate circle of revelation? And here's what I mean by that. We can trust that Paul had insight from God. We have all sorts of other information from how he received insight and how the Holy Spirit was working on him. That's great. Like, and if you know Paul, good. That's the immediate revelation. But he also wrote to Timothy. And so Timothy, because he's connected to Paul, he now knows, like, well, this is something that's not just from Paul. Um, Peter even goes on to say that uh, people will twist the scriptures like they do, and he's including Paul's writing in that. So Timothy recognizes that this authoritative word from Paul is also from God. And even Paul's audience who read that letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, those people who heard it immediately, they may have known Timothy and Paul. And so that's great. That's the immediate circle of revelation. But here's the problem. None of us fit into that circle. Not in the same way, right? I don't know Paul. Haven't met him. Great guy. Never met him, right? Same thing with Timothy. I, I don't know him. I don't have a personal connection with those guys. So what we need is some other kind of mechanism that comes along that actually brings us to a point where we can trust that what has been handed down has in fact been handed down reliably for us. The reason why I want to tell you about these Bibles is because, or this Bible in particular, is because I want to tell you what's going on with these. I preached my first sermons, taught my first Bible study out of this. This dude is wore out. And what I'm planning on doing with this is that whenever 
Callie, my oldest daughter, whenever she's 18, high school, whatever age, whenever we figure that out, this Bible is going to go to her. And then the Bible that I got after this guy uh, is in much better shape, but it's still pretty toe up. And then whenever Letty, my middle daughter, whenever she's of age, she'll get that one. And right now, I've got a decade to work on the Bible that I have right now, and I'm going to wear that joker out too, and I'm going to give that to my youngest daughter. And so you see that what I want them to do is I want them to immediately receive what I am giving to them because they have a relationship with me, and there's meaning right there. I want them to receive it. And that's a cool gift. But it is not enough. What I really want for them is for them to dive into the content of what's on these craggly pages, right, that are dirty and barely held together. I want them to see the value of what is in there, not because of the relationship they have with me and my notes, but rather because they have a relationship with the Lord and they have seen that it comes from him and not from me. Are you tracking with that? Like, that's what I want for them. And so whenever we answer this question of how do we know, well, the answer to that is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. So let's read that for us right now. If you would throw that up there for me, if you don't mind. 2 Timothy chapter 3, picking it up in verse 14 as my iPad restarts. This is what Paul writes. He says, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. You see the relational aspect? He connects, hey, you heard this, but you, you got to learn it and move beyond it. Whom you have learned it from, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That was last week. This is this week. Verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Whenever we look at 2 Timothy and we start looking at this, this document that is sent from Paul, this letter that's written to Timothy, we can trust that there is revelation there, but what we need to see is that it is also inspired. And so what I'm going to pray for right now is that we would feel that even today as we are hearing the rest of the sermon. So let's pray together. Let's pray over our time for this morning. Let's do that. Father, I thank you that you have, in fact, given us your word and that you have, in fact, brought us to a point where we can comprehend what it says and that we can know truly that this is you speaking to us through your word. And so, Father, I pray that that would be made clear throughout the rest of the sermon. I pray that you would send your spirit to be able to help us understand what it is that you have recorded for our benefit. And Father, I pray that as we are working through this, that you would give us your personal word and your presence to us through your spirit, and that you would do the work that I cannot do. And as is my custom, I would just ask that you would pray for me, that you would pray that the words that I say would be beneficial, that the words that I say would be accurate, and that they would uh, make sense all along the way. If you would, take a moment and pray for me, if you would. Father, I thank you for the chance to be able to prepare, to be able to study, to be able to think, and to be able to meditate and dwell on your word and its nature. And Father, I know that right now what I need is your help in understanding exactly what it is that you have written for us. And so, Father, I pray that as you um, are doing your work, God, that you would give me clarity of thought, that you would give me everything that I need to be able to speak well during this time. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I've already kind of spilled the beans, let the cat out of the bag about what we're talking about. We're talking about inspiration. So I want to go ahead and give you the main idea. Go ahead and write this down if you're taking notes. This is the main idea of the whole sermon. What Paul says, especially in uh, verse 16 of chapter 3 here, he says that all scripture is inspired by God. It's breathed out or it's God breathed, your translation may say. The reason why we use that phrase inspired is because that's from King James. Uh, what King James says is that all of the scriptures are inspired of God. And so that's why we use this term of inspiration. And the word that Paul actually uses there, he probably just made it up. He's using two words and he just jams them together for the word for God and the word for breathe. And 
boom, it's God breathed. That's how we get it. And so what we need to talk about is not just the idea of how this happens, we'll handle this in a bit, but I want to talk about what exactly this means. And so I want to actually define for you what inspiration is. I'm going to give us a working definition that we're going to use for the rest of the morning. So write this down. When I say the inspiration of the Word of God, this is what I mean. I mean that there is this superintending of the Holy Spirit, this superintending the Holy Spirit sits above and he makes sure it operates exactly as he wants. It is this superintending of the Holy Spirit over human authors so that their writings are an accurate record of God's revelation, right? Because that's the question that we have before us. How do we trust beyond that immediate circle of revelation that what we have is authoritative, that what we have is accurate? Well, the answer to that is the inspiration of the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit is sitting above this process and he is working through human authors so that we get what we have in our lap right now. Does that make sense? And so whenever we talk about this, we're necessarily going to be talking about dual authorship um, of the Bible. Let me just kind of explain what this means. Whenever we ask the question, who wrote the Bible? An answer that should pop to your mind is if we're reading First or Second Timothy is, well, Paul, because he wrote those letters, and that would be great, or Luke, or Matthew, or any of the books of Moses, so we would say Moses wrote that, and that would be correct, but we also have to say that not only did men write the Bible, but God authored the Bible. It is a cooperative work between man and God, and that's what we call dual authorship. Um, I know for our kids, we've done a catechism, and I've talked with Pastor JP and Pastor Anthony. They have different catechisms they use for their children. And there's different ways of formulating this, but the question of who wrote the Bible is some answer that sounds like a holy God using holy men. Is this making sense? Like, if we are approaching Scripture and we are going to say that it is, in fact, authoritative, then we have to have an answer for why. And what I'm saying is the inspiration of the Word of God helps answer that. So, here's my first point. Whenever we talk about all this stuff about the main idea of all scripture is God breathed, and I talk about dual authorship, here's what I would say. The word of, or excuse me, the composition of the word of God is a cooperative act between God and man. Make sense? And I know that that might sound a little fuzzy, but let me kind of clear this up. Whenever we say who wrote the Bible, it must be God and man. It must be a holy God using holy men. If we recognize that God has, in fact, revealed himself to someone in history, that is great news, right? That's great news that God will have told somebody about who he is. Now, if we happen to know who that person is, that's good news. Because now I can just talk to that dude, and he can tell me what he knows about God. But for us, if we are beyond that immediate circle of revelation, if we don't know Paul, if we don't know Timothy, if we weren't that immediate audience that was receiving a letter that Paul wrote, well, then we need some other mechanism, right? And that other mechanism is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit superintending this process where he is working with men. I believe that the right way to envision this is what we would call the verbal plenary or plenary uh, inspiration theory. One idea that we could think of of how God handed down Scripture would be what we call dictation. So you have Paul, he's sitting in a room, he's got a desk, a couple of candles, big old feather, you know, dipping in the inkwell and whatever he's using, right? And that he's ready to receive whatever God's going to tell him, and then he just like enters like this trance-like state and just starts writing down whatever the Lord is telling him. And then whenever he comes to, like, Ugh, Romans is in front of him. That's impressive, right? I don't think that's how it actually works. I don't think that that is accounting for how God is going to use men in this equation. It is a cooperative act between God, yes, superintending this process, but he's going to use the experiences, the expertise, the word choice, the personalities of these human authors as the words are given to them. He's going to use all of those things to bring to bear precisely what it is that he wants written. This is how Rob Plummer defines uh, this idea of... Uh, this cooperative work between God and man. This is what he says. While the authors of the Bible wrote as thinking, feeling human beings, God so mysteriously superintended the process that every word written was also the exact word he wanted to be written. Let me explain it this way. 
the Bible tells us that men are not the sole authors of Scripture. If you go look in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, I'm going to read it in a second. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, this is what Peter writes, and, and have this in our brain as I read this. Peter says, and we, his immediate audience, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention to as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Pay attention. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. You see how that's working? What Peter is saying is somebody didn't just go into this trance-like state, wake up, boom, they've got Isaiah in front of them. Like, that's not the idea that's being conveyed here. God is using the personality, expertise, and all those different elements that we would have um, that we bring to bear. Let me illustrate this in Scripture another way. In Amos chapter 7, uh, there's this minor prophet. He's from a place called Tekoa. He's a country bumpkin from nowhere, fell off the turnip truck, right? He's a farmer, and he ends up going to the northern kingdom, and he is going to pro proclaim the Lord's message to them. He's going to be speaking truth to power. And this is what Amos chapter 7, verses 14 through 16 say. And then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, who was the high priest up there, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of the sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear what the word of the Lord is. You see that Amos was saying, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. He's a prophet, right? But, but you get what he's saying is, this is not my profession. This is not what I did. I had goats. I had trees. That's what I had. And God called me and said, go up there and speak my word to my people. What I think is going on here is that the Lord is using every experience, every expertise, every personality trait and quirk about the biblical authors, and he is using those to bring out the message that he wants to have communicated. And we see that from Amos to Amaziah to the northern kingdom, even though he wasn't the guy who was super well-trained in this. Okay, Now, let me explain it this way. Um, before Christmas break, my oldest daughter had to write a paper uh, about a state um, within the Union, and so she decided to write uh, a paper on Arkansas, you know, state bird, only state that has diamonds, all these other unique facts. Uh, and I can say just authoritatively, um, having lived here for two years, Arkansas is superior to the show me state in every way. Don't at me, you can catch me later, we'll fight about it then, right? It's a fact, I got the mic, okay? So after that paper was turned in, Callie was given some corrections. Here's some punctuation. Here's some spelling errors. Here's some of this other stuff. And she was supposed to correct that. Now, suppose for a moment that I then grab that paper and I make those corrections. And because I know more about Arkansas, I start infusing some of my own ideas into it. In fact, what I'm probably going to do is end up changing the tone. I'm going to use different words. I'm going to spell things correctly. Eh, maybe, right? But here's my point. Just because that I would be writing that as opposed to my daughter, that doesn't change the fact that the content is correct. But what it does show is that somebody else is involved in this process, right? It shows that there is clearly a difference in tone and content and all that good jazz. But here's why it really matters. When we run across reading Paul in Philippians, and things are great, about joy and rejoicing, and we're like, ah, that's the book for me right there. Short, to the point. Oh, man, this is great. Roll on. And then you go read Galatians, and he's like, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Y'all need to quit being cowards and cutting around and cut through. If you know, you know. Paul's tone is radically different. And we have a problem with that for some reason because it doesn't cohere in our minds with, well, this is what I expect from Paul. But here's what the real problem is. When we start looking at those comparisons and we start making uh, these really close comparisons, what we actually end up doing a lot of times is we create this hierarchy of biblical books that we say, ah, this is the one we really need. And then we'll throw Job way down here, right? We'll put Ecclesiastes down there because who wants to read Lamentations? Right? Don't lie to me. We do that. Right? A lot of times we can just kind of put in our mind, these are the books that are the good ones. 
But what Paul is saying is that all Scripture is breathed out by God, and what we're going to see is all Scripture is useful. Now, what's incumbent upon us is when we see these different authors and these different tones, it's incumbent upon us to understand why. What is going on? Word? All right, so here's the first application. Don't make these hierarchy of books that you think are better or others that are worse. What Paul says is that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Word? All right, that's main point number one. Let me give us our second one. We just address like the human component of what it looks like with men and their experiences and word choice and all those good things coming into the fray. But now we need to address the, the, the divine side of dual authorship, that it was written by God and man, right? Since we know that God is involved in this process of revelation and inscripturation, well, then we can start making a couple of different um, assertions about that. And here's the next thing you need to write down. The word of God is trustworthy because its source is thoroughly reliable, right? <clears throat> we might say that, well, Paul may have messed something up. He may not have heard correctly. Okay, well, then to that, I would give you the Holy Spirit's superintending of this process so that nothing is going to be out of sorts in any way. It's going to be precisely what he is after. Are you tracking with that? Like, this is where we have to hold both humans and a divine source of the Word of God. The Word of God is trustworthy because its source is thoroughly reliable. If we return back to that central issue of how do we know, well, then we've got to have a reliable source. How do we know that revelation for me today is the same as it was for them and it's reliable? We have to have divine authorship there. I, I think we can trust in divine authorship uh, with all sorts of other verses in scripture. We literally do not have time to get through that. I had to cut all that out. Catch me after this. I'll talk with you about it. I promise you it is there and I can even share a little bit more a little bit later on. But let me be explicit in what I'm saying here. Whenever I say that the word of God is trustworthy, what I mean is it is inerrant and it is infallible. Those, those three words, trustworthy, inerrant, and infallible, are really precise words that have different meanings. But here's Here's what I want you to understand when I say trustworthy and inerrant. Here's the definition of inerrant. Again, comes from Rob Plummer. He says, the Bible is completely truthful in all things that the biblical authors assert. The words are divinely guarded from all error. Now, an uh, easy critique of this statement would be, oh, well, yeah, but the Bible doesn't talk about thermodynamics and nuclear fusion, so the Bible can't be correct. And what I would say is the Bible doesn't address those things. There's nothing wrong with there being certain precise applications of truth that we know are out in the world that the Bible doesn't address. What inerrancy means is that everything that the biblical authors do tell us is truthful. And the reason it's truthful is not because the biblical authors are omniscient, it's because God is. And if God is, then what is produced that comes from him is going to cohere with that same quality of being trustworthy, reliable, inerrant, infallible, incapable of error. Y'all seeing that? So if you don't understand what inerrancy means, let me explain it to you in this way. Um, how many of y'all had hail damage in your vehicles over the last year from like those two different hail storms that we had like a month and a half apart? Okay, does anyone know how they actually work on those dudes? Sometimes they put like a big old plunger device on there and they just yank on that dude and it pops out, right? But more times than not, or at least this used to be the old school way of doing it, you would use a tool that looked like this. And it's a little placard about that big and it's got these really colorful lines that are completely, perfectly parallel. And what they would do is they would suction cap that joker right next to where the hail damage was and they would take a really bright light and they would shine it on to where the damage was. And if you look up there on those two little circles, the one on the right, you'll see that those perfectly straight lines aren't quite so perfectly straight. And then they have these different tools, and they would knock the dent in from the other side until it's completely planar like that first little circle. This is how the Word of God works for us. The Word of God itself, because this is from a reliable source, is like that placard of those perfectly parallel lines, and you will see that this is... No deviation. It is all perfectly coherent, reliable. And then the word is having this light shine on it, or excuse me, on these damage, this non-planar metal that's all jacked up. That's us. And what our job is, according to Anthony last week, is as we see Revelation, our job is to respond properly. 
so now we got to make some changes. We've got to knock that dent out this way. We've got to move it over a little bit. We've got to put a little more pressure here, there, wherever it may be. Are you tracking with me? This is what I mean by inerrant and infallible, that the Word of God is the standard, and it is the standard because it comes from a good standard bearer. But this now brings us to a new issue. So what? That's the real question. So what? What does this matter? If we do have this trustworthy revelation of God, how is it that we're to respond? Like, we just throw the gates open and say, oh, you can just do whatever you want. No. Paul actually tells us how we are to respond. Let's go back to 2 Timothy. Let's look at verse 16 real quick. This is what Paul tells Timothy. All Scripture is inspired of God, breathed out by God. God breathed, right? All Scripture is breathed out in that way. And then he says, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. If you don't really know what reproof, again, how many of y'all use the word reproof, uh, you know, recreationally? Okay, I don't. I picked this up from our pastor in, uh, in Fable whenever I was in college. He says this. He tells us that the word of God is useful for telling us what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. That is what teaching, what is right, what is not right is the reproof, how to get right, that's correction, and then how to stay right is this training in righteousness. And hear me clearly, I believe that this is what the Word of God does for us. In fact, even though Jacob didn't know this is what was going to be on the slide, this is what he was reading in Job. We may not know the purpose, but God has a purpose behind sending the snow and the ice, right? Right? And the Word of God is useful for telling us what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. And let me just tell you this. None of that matters if the Word of God is wrong. Yeah? None of this matters if the Word of God can be off a little bit. Because maybe then our assumption about what is right, if it's coming from a source that is incorrect, how dangerous can that be? And then how to correct it and how to stay that way. If any bit of that is off, then we've got no hope of actually addressing these ills in our life because we must have a reliable source. We must have God inspire the word in such a way that retains this quality of cohering with who he is as truthful, as inerrant, as infallible, as the source of truth. Word? You tracking with me on that? So... All of this hinges on the revelation that was given from God to these human authors being right and being reliable and being transmitted to us in a useful way. That's what we call this inspiration. So I just want to return back to our main idea. What Paul says is that all Scripture is breathed out by God and that it is inspired. Here's what I've said a lot this morning, but let me just recap real quickly. Revelation, the revelation of the Word of God necessitates a reliable source. Paul asserts that God's word is in, fact, is in fact inspired, all of it. And that God's word is a cooperative work between God and man. And that God's word is infallible and inerrant. We just talked about those things, right? So let me give you our two major applications. I've given you a couple along the way, but here's the two big ones. Write these down. Number one, if we understand this inspiration, here's what I would say. Difficult passages are now made easier to accept when we recognize their source. Difficult passages are now made easier for us to accept because we know who it comes from. Right now, we are finishing up Job, okay, in our Bible reading plan. So if you're not there, you've got time to catch up. It's a great, great ending. I'll say it that way. Horrible beginning, a whole lot of weird stuff in the middle, but at the end, it starts getting a little more clear. But let me go ahead and spoil it for you. Uh, Job never finds out why he suffered. Job doesn't find out. Take it a step further. You don't get an answer as to why Job suffered. I would put that in a category of, that's a kind of a difficult text. What am I supposed to do with Job? Well, if I hold the idea of the inspiration of the Word of God firmly in saying that it is from an author that is being... Uh, having this presence of the Holy Spirit over him, superintending every word to be precisely 
<clears throat> what he wants it to be, and if that scripture is useful for telling me what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right, well, now I can start extracting, okay, I don't understand exactly what's going on with Job, but I see how that connects to Proverbs. I can see how Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar, his, Job's three idiot friends, right? He calls them worthless counselors, useless companions, like not great dudes, right? That's what Job calls them. We can start hearing the book of Proverbs on their lips. And we can hear Job's story coming out in Ecclesiastes. Yeah, sometimes it, it'd be like that, right? And what our response then at that time to that revelation is to see, hey, this is a place where we can explore the realities of life being sad. There's going to be suffering. It can be dangerous. <clears throat> but that God's still in control. That would be so much harder for me to arrive at if I did not know that the source was reliable and trustworthy. Word? So we have got to see this. Those difficult passages may be difficult to accept along the way, <clears throat> but they are made easier knowing who their source is. <clears throat> we'll get there. Here's my second major application. Write this one down. If we understand the inspiration of the Holy Spirit inspiring the Word of God, then obedience now has an elevated position once we understand that. If you view the Word of God as coming not just from some dude named Paul or Luke or Moses or Jeremiah or whoever, and you actually see, actually, I, this is coming from God, you are now forced to make a decision. You are forced. Because if revelation is meant to bring about this response of what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right, there's no such thing as being neutral on a moving train here, right? You're going somewhere. You now have to make a decision. Are you going to obey or are you going to be obstinate? Now, that obedience may very well be you intellectually need to change your mind. Some new information was given to you. I now have to respond to that and say, actually, I accept that. It might be that you are encouraged in something that you already know. It very well may be something that you have to work hard to root out some sin in your life. I want to tell you about one of those for me. Over the last couple of weeks, um, I feel like the Lord's been showing me some stuff that, frankly, I do not like. And, and by the way, this is going to be the same thing that happens for you all, too. God's going to show you something. If you're reading the Word, there's going to be something that he's going to put his finger on. He's going to say, what do you think about that? Over the last couple of weeks, I feel like the Lord's been showing me, you know, maybe you're far too connected to that little rectangle that's in your pocket way too much. Maybe you're seeking this little source of information and, and entertainment it's sitting over there. I don't have it in my pocket. See? Maybe you're connected to that far more than you should be. And, in fact, not only are you just doom scrolling, just looking at whatever useless junk happens to be in those pixels, that actually there are other people who are suffering because of it, because my children are downstairs playing, and I could be down there with them, but I'm not. And I am now forced to make a decision. Am I going to go with God and say, you know what, yeah, you're right, <laughs> I need to make a change, or am I going to be obstinate? That is my choice. It's, it's to the point where over the last week or so I've actually been playing with my home screen to like, move things off the home screen so I have to intentionally go pursue this other kind of entertainment. But let me tell you, if that doesn't work, I've actually talked to Anthony about this. You know what my next step is? Your boy's about to get a flip phone. And every one of you just moaned a little bit because now that I put that out into the world, you now know that's an option too. I don't know if that's what the Lord's telling you to do. I hope that's not exactly what the Lord's telling me to do at this point, but I've got a choice to make. I'm either going to obey or I can continue in obstinance. And that's how revelation and response works over and over again. Let me be really clear. <clears throat> this revelation and response thing is not just a one-time salvific thing. <clears throat> God is calling all of us who are believers in Jesus to respond to his word. <clears throat> I want to read for us something from Acts. I just want to let us know. Christian, non-Christian, whether you're reading along with me, whether you're watching this after the fact, whether you're hearing it, whatever. All of us start out in an obstinate position. Every one of us. In fact, what Paul says is that all of us, because of our sin nature, are 
objects of God's wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But praise God, because of the love of God, he sends his son and pays a penalty for us. This is what Paul says in Acts chapter 17. Let me read it for us. <clears throat> Paul says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Okay, let me just pause for a second. How many of y'all fit into a category that is outside of all people everywhere? <clears throat> Loud. Put your hand up. All people everywhere are commanded to repent. And if that is the first time you're ever hearing these words and you don't understand what salvation looks like, well, then your repentance is towards salvation. If you are a believer in Jesus, that repentance is away from your selfish desires and being conformed into the image of his son. This is not a one-time deal. It starts with salvation, but it is ongoing. He says that God has commanded all people everywhere to repent because he, God, <clears throat> has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Who is that man? He's the same one that he has given us assurance by raising him from the dead. Because he has raised Christ from the dead, Jesus will be the one one day will say, hey, what did you do with that offer of salvation? Were you obstinate in remaining in your sin? Or did you obey this summons, this command to salvation and repentance? The band's going to come up. We're going to talk about how we respond to that today. As they're making their way up here, I just want to address the, the couple of different types of people that we see in the room here. If you are a believer in Jesus and things are going well, then what I would say you need to do in your act of obedience and response here is to search your heart and to see if there's anything you do need to repent of. Maybe you were spending too much time on your phone. Maybe you're doing some other frivolous thing, whatever. I, I don't know what that is for you. There's no way I could know. But if you're a believer and you're feeling that, I assure you that ain't me. That is not me telling you that. You need to respond to that in repentance. If you're a believer and things are not going so hot, you probably already know what that thing is. I would urge you to respond in repentance. Seek God's grace. He will give it. What 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says is that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But here's the third group of people. There's some of y'all in this room or watching this online that maybe you've never made that first step of repentance. Maybe you've never heard the story of Jesus told in such a way that says, actually, there is an offer of forgiveness. <clears throat> you can remain obstinate in your sin, in your lostness, in your brokenness, or you can respond to this message of grace and you can trust that God will save you because the one whom he has appointed to be the one who is going to judge in righteousness was also given life after his death to demonstrate that he is the one who can give life to you. And if that's you, what you need to hear from me today is, yeah, Paul is commanding that God has said all people need to repent. <clears throat> that's for you. It's not for your neighbor, it's for you. And today can be the day of salvation. That's what it means. So if you never had that moment, you want to have a conversation with me about what that looks like, I'm going to be right up here. Pastor Anthony will be here. Afterwards, we'll be hanging out back there. Pastor JP will be at the front. Like, you got to respond. I don't know how you're going to respond. I don't know what you need to do to respond, but we got to respond. And for some of us, if we're Christians, that response looks like us standing and singing loudly as we talk about and sing about how the same God who raised Jesus from the dead is the same one who can give us life today. So let's pray, and then we'll respond. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that you have given us an opportunity to respond, that you have, in fact, given us this summons, this command to repent and that we can keep that in front of us, and that, Lord, that we have an avenue, that we have an advocate at the right hand of the Father who is the righteous one, namely Jesus Christ, who is interceding for us and can cleanse us of all for uh, unrighteousness and sin and guilt, and he can give us his righteousness. Father, I thank you that that is true. I pray that we will hear that rightly, and I pray that we will respond in the way that honors you. And we pray all this in your son's name. I'm going to ask you to stand and respond however it is that the Lord's leading you.